My name is Susan Testrode Bajeron. I am interviewing Mr. Eddie Sapier about his memories and experiences concerning Louisiana's coastal wetlands. The interview is being conducted at Mr. Eddie's home on uh, Friday, June 22nd, 2012 at 9.40 in the morning. Um, Mr. Sapier's home is where we're doing our video. Do you understand that portions of this tape and the pictures that we're going to take uh, will be used in a variety of publications? Did you want me to say yes? Yes. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you for speaking with us today. And uh, we signed all of our consent forms. And we're going to get some basic information from you first. And then we're going to talk about your memories. So start by stating your full name. Eddie Joseph Sapier, Jr. And what is your date of birth, and where were you born? March 27, 1934. My, my papers of birth was in New Orleans. Good. And where did you grow up, Eddie? Right here. <laughs> on this by on Barataria. Very good. So tell us a little bit about a childhood memory that connects you with all of these beautiful wetlands. Good gracious. My grandfather, I used to follow him. When I quit school, I went to work with him on boats, driving his boats at, at an early age. And when I wasn't doing that, I was trapping and fishing and trawling and everything in the fishing lines. And that's why I love this place. So tell us, um, you say you grew up here, and where did you stay as an adult? What's that? Where did you go as an adult? I mean, where was your adult life? Here. So tell us what you did here in your adult life that's connected well, to I got life. older, with trawling and all that again. Then I got married in 60, and uh, I made my living here. I lived on... Uh, See, Barry Terry, I lived on there for a while with me and my wife. And then I bought this place from, from uh, a fellow by the name uh, Banker, Royce Banker. Sold me this land. And then I built my home here. So you, when we st started today, you showed me some pictures of uh, your trawl boats. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about what it was like to go trawling and how it, your family life was. If heaven would be that good, I don't mind. That that was the best. Whenever I get out trawling, it, it, it makes me just feel so wonderful. Okay, so tell me about, uh, like, let's say I, I've never been trawling. I've never been. So tell me a little bit about what it'd be like if I could go on a trawling trip with you when you what were What it would be there. like? Yeah. You'd, yeah. you'd enjoy your life. Honest, you sure would. Because once you're out there, it's a different feeling all together. It's not like going to the city of New Orleans or nothing like that. To me, I'd rather be out in that Gulf than anywhere. So when would you leave the house? When, like, well, uh, how do you mean? Uh, like uh, you'd leave like on a Monday and you'd go oh, out? No, like then must make no d d different days. Whenever we're, we're ready to leave, you just leave. You go out, and you, well, like me, I used to stay six, seven days out, and then I come back home. So all my shrimp, and then that, that was it. So how many people, what kind of boat you had? How many people will go with you? Well, my name on my boat was the special lady, the last one, and my wife and my daughter was my crew. And we went, we went out and stood, like I say, eight, nine days, or six days, or seven days. And we went all over, we went towards Delco, towards Mississippi, most of the mouth of the river, and here, and Delco was the most, most places we liked to fish. So when you weren't trawling, what would you do? What else? Different, uh, <clears throat> like a, I used to work for Watts Construction, and when I was younger, I used to drive speedboats for the different companies. So when we were inside, you showed me a picture of a big old uh, alligator. Well. The head. Tell me about that. I used to fish that. I fished that for, for around seven years. 
fish and alligators. And that's pretty good. I love it. So I've never been fishing alligators either. So tell me about what it's like to fish alligators. Well, we go out, we put poles. Well, we used to use bamboo canes, and you put an angle, and you put a clothespin on the end, and then you put a, a line with a piece of check, a chicken. And when you hook him, the next morning, like me and my brother-in-law used to go out on him on a boat and get it. He pulled, he pulled the alligator in and I shoot him. Then we'll pull him in a boat. So let me ask you this. I see this on TV, all these alligator hunters. Is it like that or is it was it different? Well, you ever watch them people, the, 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 the uh, alligator hunting uh -huh. in the West? Uh -huh. Was that like that? Yeah, sort of like that, but I didn't do it like they did. It wasn't as crazy? No, I just fish different, that's all. <laughs> okay. Um, so, if you've lived here all your life, have you seen these wetlands change? If what? If you lived here all your life, have you seen these wetlands change? Are they different than they oh, used to Oh, change. Be? Yes, ma'am. Tell me about it. Terrible. Wetland, uh, when we used to go out, like, we'd go out, like, say, uh, and we'd stay, like, home for the winter. When you went back out, you'd, so much loss of the land was gone. Sometimes you wouldn't even know hardly where you're at. I mean, it's serious. And then uh, with, with the radars on our boat, we used to have them on, and you look at that, and you look at where the land used to be, nothing but water. And I mean terrible. I'm, I mean terrible losses. But that's the way it is. Um, you told me you work with morning winter. Well, I used to be on, on, on the boat with them in New Orleans with Marna Winter and all it was we'd get around and see the areas that need to be done and, and we'd vote on it and after we vote on it then they put it in and sometime it goes true and sometime it didn't. Most of the time it, it was very hard though to get things to be done you know. I mean, it, it's, it's expensive. Yeah. It's expensive. So, but, but like I told one morning a long time ago, if we did want to fix this place up, with the Mississippi River, it's the best place in the world. You got all the sand in it, and they could use it with piping. And they can pipe it all over anywhere they want to go, but they were supposed to be, be doing that right now. Towards going towards uh, uh, Empire. Yeah, they're still going to do that. Uh, I know. I heard so they, they were. So, um, we're going to show this video to people sort of all over the nation. And there are a lot of people who've never been here, don't know what it's like here. What makes this place so much different? Well, it's not different to us. It's almost the same to us. But, I mean, what we do, we love it. And it's all, like I tell you, Cajun country. And we fish, and we do that, and we don't, we don't notice all the, the difference in the land and all that, because we know it's gone. And and heck, I mean, you get out there, and you get when you go in the bays and the lakes you used to go in before, and then you look, you look at the place, and you say, "Go, what happened to it since the little while I was home?" And that's the way it was; it just washed away. And it's like uh, I used to talk with a lot of people with money in them, and it was like that all over. Not not just over here, but it's everywhere in Louisiana. And you you almost sure y'all know about all, all over Bar La Fouche. You said you was up that way, mm -hmm. and that, up in them areas, uh, terrible losses. So we're trying to also record why, how how the jobs and stuff have changed here. How many people are still fishing out here? Oh, Lord, we've got about half of the people that's fishing. Why do you think only half are fishing? Shortage of the seafood, shortage of the price of the shrimp. They don't pay us nothing for crab. I guess, man, here fishes crab. Uh, Murphy. 
and they, they don't pay hardly nothing for crab and they don't pay nothing for seafood, for shrimp. And that's the bad part. That's the worstest part. Why do you think the prices are low? Don't know, ma'am. Don't know that. Okay. Um, there's a lot of work that Quipper's doing to restore the wetlands. You're down in Barataria Bay and like we're talking over in down Baba Fouche, all around the coast, we're, we're trying to restore. And we know that the problem's way bigger than the monies we have to solve the problem. Yes, ma'am. So, um, why do you stay teaching people? I mean, you're teaching us today about what's happening here. Why, why are you still engaged? Why are you still teaching people about what's Well, happening? I'm hoping that y'all could do something, but, but what you said, and you're listening on the news, the shortage of money that they can't do it. And I mean, some places they do it, and other places they don't. And it's just, just the reasons I see when I was on a board that whatever they think they needed the most, that's where they try to get all this stuff at. And whenever they do this, and then just like I told you, when we go out there and we see the shortage of the land, uh, just like Lake Salvador. Lake Salvador, since I was a younger man, I'd say it's twice as big as it used to be. And uh, by Piro and Regalese, that's all together now. Oh, there's no more land all in, in the middle of it. It's all gone. And I guess it don't help out anything else. So how do you think we can get the nation to know that we need their help? <laughs> I don't know, ma'am. I don't know that. I wish I did. I wish I did, but uh, it, all it is, is that, to me, they work from inside going out. They should work from the Gulf coming in. Fix the Gulf for all the sea coasts first. Then it would help out a lot better. Yeah, and we're doing some coastal restoration. Yes, ma'am, I know that. But you're right, we need to, to keep after it. Um, you talked a little bit, I want to go back to one of the stories you kind of started with, with trawling. You showed us some pictures of Blessing of the Fleet. Tell us a little bit about what Blessing of the Fleet was like in the past and how it is now. Blessing of the Fleet was a big, big thing at one time. This year was the most boats I've ever seen. But but most of the time there's hardly no boats at all to get blessed. So what happens at the Blessing of the Fleet? I don't know. It's just that people just don't go to it anymore. And half of the, we, the big boats, where we got two boats, we might have had 50 boats. So tell me what the boats look like when they come and where where do they bless them? Tell me about that stuff. They come, well, they come from the house, just like at this house. You leave you from your wharf and you go all out and they'll run all the way to the feet. And they'll turn around and they'll come back and then when by, by the time they get back, by the bridge, then the priest start blessing the boat. And how do the boats look? And then they go from here to Lake Salvador, some of the boats, and they turn around, some people go swimming, <laughs> some people just come back and go back to the wall. So how do the boats look? What do the boats look like? We're gonna take a picture and... and well, they're, they're beautiful, they're all freshly painted, they're all decorated, and they got a lot of music on some of the big boats, and they gotta have a good, good time. 